New World, Lost Ark, two big new MMOs with even bigger player counts at launch. We're talking millions of concurrent players, but what else do these games have in common? Well, two things really. They were published by Amazon Games, and they also quickly lost those massive player counts and headed into obscurity, losing money, losing player interests, and now they're basically on life support compared to their initial launch numbers. Now, what if I told you that another huge MMO was about to release in 2024 from the same publisher as New World and Lost Ark, that being Amazon Games? What would you think about its chances of growing and retaining a loyal player base, not just for the short term, but into the foreseeable future? <laughs> Now, the MMO we are talking about, of course, is the upcoming Throne and Liberty, which has since been delayed from its global release now, which was scheduled for September, but is being pushed back to October 1st. Now, I actually don't think this new delay is going to be much of a concern. Many titles do this as they near that launch window and they look to polish their final product. After all, you only have one chance to make a first impression, but today's video sponsor is making a great first impression with their latest expansion, and that is Guild Wars 2 Janthier Wilds. I'm sure you've all heard of Guild Wars 2, the free-to-start MMORPG that respects players' time, and their latest expansion, Janthir Wilds, is set to release on August 20th. There are tons of new features on offer here, of course, with the first being a new weapon type, the two-handed spear. Janthir Wilds will also allow players to freely swap between aquatic and terrestrial weapon slots, each with unique weapon skills. And even bigger is the long-requested player housing system called Homesteads, an account-wide personal instance with a home you can decorate and land you can cultivate. Mounts are also one of the most popular features in Guild Wars 2, and this expansion brings an updated Warclaw acquisition with its own mastery line. The new Warclaw mount will be automatically unlocked for all players who own Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns or Guild Wars 2 Path of Fire. Plus, this latest expansion includes even more content, including three new open-world explorable maps, 50 player events called Convergences, the new Fractal Dungeon with Challenge Mode for 10-player groups, plus the Wizard's Vault rewards. So to get started, just click the link down in the description or the pinned comment below, and thanks again to Guild Wars 2 for sponsoring this video. Now to say that I'm worried about Throne of Liberty would be an understatement, but not for the reasons you might think. But that's because I have played this game a lot. I've participated in multiple betas at this point, and my gameplay experience has actually improved each time. So in my estimation, Throne and Liberty does have a lot to offer to MMO players, and I think it's safe to say that it will also have a massive launch, similar to those previous Amazon Games titles like New World and Lost Ark, probably somewhere between 500,000 and a million players concurrent on Steam. But that's because no matter what year it is, no matter who the developer or the publisher is, MMO players are always looking to get that new, fresh MMO experience that we all know and love. I mean, be honest, it's why we play MMOs. Nothing beats the experience of joining thousands of nearly naked players waving sticks and slaughtering rats or mosquitoes with whatever basic gear we can find. Starting from zero, building up your character, it's what we live for as MMO players and it's why these games consistently have such huge turnouts at launch. Now that being said, with what I've seen so far with Throne and Liberty, while it does have many positive elements, I think there is still a huge chance that it will go down the exact same sad and sorry path of New World and Lost Ark to a quiet MMO grave of shattered dreams and lost potential if something doesn't change soon, like really soon. We're gonna get in deep to the good and the bad elements here, but let's start with what's good, and that's the graphics and the playable environments in Throne and Liberty, which are amazing. There are just some jaw-dropping step-out moments in this game in terms of its locations. There's also plenty of variation in those locations as well, whether it's dense forests, desolated deserts, or dark and scary dungeons. The landscape here doesn't disappoint, and I found myself exploring the world just for the fun of it. And once you get into towns and villages, these also look fantastic, with lots of details, and these are massive as well. I mean, I was assuming just the starting city would be filled out like this, but as I progressed to later cities, I was presently surprised with the same amount of depth, the same detail, still present there even as you approach Endgame. Now, combat in my view is another big positive for Throne and Liberty, though I know there are mixed reviews when it comes to combat, and that's not surprising to me actually. MMO players do tend to be very specific in terms of the types of combat they enjoy, but for me, I did like it. Throne and Liberty features the usual lock-on tap target mechanics with auto-attacking combined, and of course lots of unique skills which function on cooldowns. 
Again, I felt it played well, especially in terms of visual and sound design. Your skills for the most part look and sound amazing. And while Throne and Liberty does not feature specific classes, it does have multiple weapon types, which function basically like classes of their own, letting players make use of two weapons simultaneously to really shake things up in terms of those usable skills. But unlike other MMOs like ESO or let's say New World for example, where you have to actively swap to a different weapon to make use of its weapon skills, Throne and Liberty actually lets you use weapon skills from either of your two equipped weapons at the same time, regardless of which weapon happens to be currently active for your character. So in other words, the weapon you have active really only controls your auto attack and it doesn't limit your skill usage between the two equipped weapons, which feels actually surprisingly good compared to other games. I actually love this and it helped me build into that quote class identity I was trying to get customizing between my two weapons. And I think skills for the most part were also really enjoyable and I had a lot of fun mixing and matching weapons like the staff, the longbow, sword and shield, daggers, a great sword and many more to create these unique builds. For example, you could easily create a paladin style build by combining the wand weapon, which includes a lot of healing and buff abilities with either the sword and shield for tankiness or the great sword for more offensive capability. This felt a lot like New World in that regard, but was actually better because Throne and Liberty has significantly more active skills and passive skills to choose from than New World did to start with. Plus you have an ultimate and defensive parries. And like I said, you can use those skills at any time, regardless of which weapon you have on your main hand, as long as the skill is off cooldown. Now one criticism here, and this was just like New World 2, is that I would like to see all weapon types in Throne and Liberty have at least one self healing skill to make playing without a dedicated healer more viable. Now yeah, you do have a little pet or a companion for lack of a better term, which actually follows you around and helps you regenerate health, but that's not nearly enough for taking on multiple enemies at once or more difficult locations like public dungeons, for example. Now, apparently combat and Throne and Liberty will also be getting a major update at the global launch, which is, remember, delayed now until October 1st. So there's this new skill trade system or skill customization system. I'm not quite sure what it's called yet, and this was actually not available for testing in that latest beta, but it does look fantastic. Now, the idea with these skill traits is that it allows you to add on extra effects to your existing skills. Kind of similar to scribing for the Elder Scrolls Online, if you've played that, but really focus on customizing existing skills uh, from your skill loadout for each weapon. Now, from what I've heard, you can add maybe up to three or four different effects to most skills. And this would include things like increased radius, increased range, bonus, you know, status effect damage, some extra CCs or stuns. Plus, I believe they're also introducing one new skill for each weapon, which is, again, going to be customizable with these different skill traits. So I think a lot of people may not realize how good combat and Throne and Liberty can actually be. There is a lot of potential here, and most of us haven't even played with this new customization system, which isn't, again, coming until the global launch in October. But if the graphics are this good and the combat has so much potential, then I hear you asking what is the problem with Throne and Liberty and why might it not make it past its first few months of full release? Well, I think there's really two issues here and these are always, without a doubt, the primary killers of any MMO in my opinion. Those are number one, lack of content, and number two, monetization. So let's talk about content first because it's actually pretty simple. As I'm sure you know, in MMOs, players need things to do. And while Throne and Liberty is definitely in a better place content wise than let's say New World was when that launched, there are definitely a few areas where I know players are going to start complaining and dropping out once they get to a certain point. Now, specifically, I'm talking about PVE content here. And yeah, there are plenty of large overland zones for players to explore. And while they are definitely beautiful to look at, there's just not a lot to do within them. For example, most enemies in Throne and Liberty are sort of stagnant and they just stand there, really. Many enemies don't even react to players, even if you think they would because of their, you know, faction being a goblin or a wolf or a spider or whatever, they can just ignore you all day unless you attack them first. And then there's not really a lot of side quests or side content that you're going to discover when you're out roaming around the zone like you might in other MMOs, like the Elder Scrolls Online, for example. 
Now, yeah, there is a major storyline that's going to take you from one zone to the next with a series of connected quests. And along the way, you might pause and you might get offered like a side mission or two, but that's really only in major cities or population centers. But like I said, when you're traveling about, there's really not much of anything else to discover in terms of story or questing, which I think might aggravate some players. And yes, there are, quote, public events where players can loosely team up in an area, but that's more like kill as many goblins as possible or harvest as many wolf pelts as possible. And the top, let's say, 10 players in the zone get a reward that, you know, that kind of thing. It is fun to do the first one or two times, but after that, I never went back. It felt tedious and the rewards you got were just not worth the time that you spent. There's also journal entries and pages you can collect which expand on the game's lore, though again that is a bit sporadic and hard to decipher. And having played most of the main story myself, I definitely had trouble connecting any of the dots to uncover a larger narrative that made sense in Throne and Liberty, it doesn't seem like there's one really cohesive story. It almost feels like random quests tied together because they just wanted them to be tied together and call it the main story quest. Maybe this is also partly a translation issue, I don't know, but I think players could also be disappointed in this story that doesn't really seem to go anywhere, at least not yet. And there's also group Q dungeons which are cool and have interesting mechanics, but again this is only really a handful of these but there's really only a handful of those right now, and players will quickly get tired of them after repeating these just a few times. But there's also public dungeons which don't offer much more in the way of loot or storytelling. And there is a solo tower activity where higher level bosses unlock as you gain levels. But again, I think most players will run through the majority of the game's PvE content, maybe like 40 hours or so, and at that point there's really not much replayability if you don't want to participate in PvP, which I know many MMO players don't. And here's the other major content problem for Throne and Liberty, and it's that the majority of endgame content is exclusively PvP focused, and it requires organized guilds. Now, I get it. From a development standpoint, it's probably easier to just create some open maps and put in some PvP objectives and call that the endgame. And some of the content is great, don't get me wrong. The open world siege maps, with the giant golems, with the guild versus guild PvP, it looks amazing. But again, that's gonna be just for guild-based, organized PvP players only. So right away, they've alienated solo players and PvE players in general from the endgame content. And believe it or not, that is a huge mistake. Just look at New World, which had large organized PvP and territory control as its endgame. Where did that get them? Look at the release of the Elder Scrolls Online, which had Cyrodiil PvP as the endgame. It didn't match the fanbase. So having PvP content is great, but they need to quickly catch up with PvE content, both for organized groups and especially for solo players if they want to be successful long term. Now I think this is interesting about MMOs, which are not purely class-based, and it's kind of a double-edged sword in a sense. In games which do have classes, like let's say the Elder Scrolls Online for example, once you reach max level on your current class and you unlock, you know, all of your skills and your passives, then there is actually an incentive to start over on a new character or on a new class because you essentially can get a different play experience if you want to. You experience the game in a different way. Your new class has new skills, new passives, different play styles, different ways to approach the game. So especially if you enjoy combat, there is that replayability element built right into a class-based MMO. Now with MMOs that don't have different classes or even different races or anything, you know, to differentiate yourself, there is much less incentive, I feel, to start a new playthrough because all you can do to differentiate your combat is swap to a different weapon and you can easily swap weapons on the same character. You don't start over. Now don't get me wrong, this is great if you don't want to change your build, if you have limited time, that's awesome. I'm not suggesting to change that aspect, but I do think it also means that players will quit or get bored sooner because they've already tried everything there is to do. I mean, once you hit endgame and Throne at Liberty, all you'll really find is, you know, small percentage based boosts that you can do to improve your weapon, upgrade your armor, improve your skills damage by like one to 3% per upgrade. And then you have to farm materials and wait for time gated drops. And it just kind of sucks the fun out of it. So I think that's hurdle number one for Throne and Liberty, is getting a decent amount of PvE content for players to enjoy, especially repeatable content. They are 
on the right track for sure. They even have that solo tower arena like I mentioned, but they'll need more of that and they'll need it soon after release to keep players engaged. Not one to two years later, but ideally one to two months after release to keep things going. Otherwise, like I said, you can expect to see a hard drop from PvE players around that time period. Then of course there is monetization, which is another issue entirely, which I know is gonna dissatisfy some players as well. The most obvious thing here is that Throne and Liberty is a free to play game with a battle pass. And now I know all the arguments such as the game needs to generate income and that, you know, the battle pass is gonna be mostly cosmetics, outfits, pets, skins, and so on, which is true to some extent, I'm sure. But I think that also overlooks a big part of Throne and Liberty, which is upgrading and upgrade materials. So in my experience, you do get better quality or larger quantities of upgrade materials with that battle pass, or at least that's what we saw during this latest beta test. So the possibility of players seeing this type of monetization and reacting negatively is pretty high in my opinion. Upgrading in Throne of Liberty just feels slow. It feels kind of clunky. And so having a faster set of upgrades, if that is locked away, that's definitely not gonna feel great. Now to explain the upgrade system further, if you have not played, I did play something like 30 hours during this last beta test, and I was only able to upgrade a few items and skills to blue quality. So that's like the second level of rarity, not even close to legendary quality. There seems to just be very limited upgrade drops present in this game from the basic things that you do, like killing enemies, doing quests or whatever. Now, on the other hand, I had millions of Solent, which is like the basic free currency that you get from killing enemies and completing quests and whatnot. But even though I had millions of that, there was basically nothing I could do with it. I couldn't buy those upgrade materials with Solent because you couldn't purchase with those. Certain upgrade materials just are not sold or you have to get the lower level material and then combine multiples to get even less of the next tier upgrade material. And again, you can't use Solent for any of it. So the main currency you get for free is basically useless. Now, this is a huge problem because again, everything in this game can be upgraded. Not talking just weapons and armor, but also skills and passives and even your ultimate abilities. Everything also has a different upgrade material which you have to collect which would be okay as long as you could get the materials easily enough or you could buy them with the currency that you get by playing the game, but you can't. Like I said, I had millions sitting in my inventory the whole week, nothing to spend it on. So yeah, definitely frustrating. But that's not all. There is an auction house in Throne and Liberty that doesn't use basic currency at all, but uses another exclusive currency, which can be bought with real world money. Now, this is really gonna drive players away if it remains in game as a roadblock to their progression. Once you require players at endgame to start taking out their credit card as the only way to get the items they need, they're just gonna stop playing or worse, they're gonna sell their own items for real world money and then leave. Now I understand that monetization is tricky, especially with free to play games like Throne and Liberty. So while I'm sure they are gonna get a ton of players at launch checking out the game, probably more than a million concurrent if I had to guess, Will those players stick around for the long haul? I'm guessing some will not, but again, it's not too late to make some changes in that regard. Throne and Liberty recently delayed their launch by about two weeks to clean up some of the game's systems before release, so there is still a chance that they can improve on some of the game's currency systems and gated progression issues to give players a reason to stick around for longer. But let me know what you all think about Throne and Liberty down in the comments section below. Have you played it? What do you think of its content and its monetization? And do you think Throne and Liberty is gonna fare similar to New World and Lost Ark or will it do better? Let me know what you think down in the comments section below. And as always, thanks for watching. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe out there and I will see you around in the next video.